Hi, Rex here at RW Mods. Today we're going to assemble this engine that we took apart in the How to Take Apart a Nitro Engine video. And we ha you can see we have it apart. We got it cleaned up. We have everything clean. And uh, I'm going to show you what I inspect. Um, you might not have the, all the tools. Actually, micrometers are really cheap. You can pick them up for 10, 20 bucks. So the, the biggest two main areas that wear, besides the, the compression and the pinch, is... Uh, is the crank and rod. So the crank pin is the highest wear piece and the, the rod bushing. And you can you can sometimes you can kind of tell how much slop you've got uh, when you kind of move it around a little bit here. This one you actually feels pretty good. You're always going to have a little movement. There has to be room for oil. There has to be clearance there for oil to be in. If you had too tight then oil wouldn't there wouldn't be enough room for oil in there. So um, what I do when I rebuild an engine is uh, use a micrometer and measure a few places all the way around. Just measure all the way around. And you see, in, I think it was one spot there. Should be. This isn't my normal mic, but. So you can see it's about a half thousandth lower on that side. And they, they won't wear around. So what happens is when that you when your engine's spinning, you have your your explosion at the top of the stroke pushes the crank, pushes the piston and rod down and, and spins the crank. So your wear will be on the, the top of the rod bushing and then the thrust side, I like to call it on the on the piston pin. So it'll wear mainly in this area. So that's why you need to check all the way around it. A caliper can kind of check it, but it's not calipers. I don't really consider accurate within under a thousandth of an inch. So it's best to have a mic. And then I, I uh, in the shop, I have a, a bore gauge to, to check how round the rod bushing is. So uh, for total wear, I I don't like to see more than three thousandths total wear between the two. So if you have two thousandths out of roundness wear. On the crank, um, actually, crank pins normally, most crank pins are 196 thousandths, and uh, if I'm if I got two thousandths wear on the crank, and a thousandths wear on the rod, that's three thousandths total, and that's kind of getting to the backup engine. Uh, when you get too much slop in there, there's a lot of movement, and you can break a rod easy. So. You know, if you're, it kind of depends on the the wear. Sometimes, if there's a thousandths uh, crank wear and two thousandths rod wear, then you end up with, uh, you could replace a rod and get, you know, and tighten things up by two thousandths. You end up with a pretty, pretty fresh engine yet. Um, I did re resize this sleeve, and that uh, that renews the compression of the sleeve. By squeezing around evenly around uh, the sleeve to renew the compression, just like you know when it was new, it was tight at the top, and as they get wear worn, uh, there's no resistance at the top. Or sometimes you, you can actually push the piston up almost flush with the top here of the sleeve. So um, I have a <clears throat> some tooling that I built to uh, renew the compression. It, it, just gently squeezes around evenly so to keep everything round. If everything's out of round, if it's out of round, it, it's still not working well. So it has to be perfectly round. And you can see I, I push up this about where it stops. And I, I don't like to over, uh, over pinch them so they um, have to be broken in too much. I, I just resize them about like an engine is after a gallon. I can see I, I resurface the top of the sleeve. If you send me a piston and sleeve just to resize, if you're if you watch the videos and you're comfortable with re rebuilding your engine yourself, then uh, <clears throat> you can just send me the piston and sleeve for fifteen dollars. I resize uh, the sleeve, and then I when I resize the sleeve, I also stone the top of the machinist stone. You can see there's a little bit of spot over on this side that didn't quite clean up. And that's pretty normal. If I take, if I go run two gallons on this and pull it back apart, it, it won't be flat again. It'll be, have a high spot or low spots. 
even new engines they aren't perfectly flat like that and because these sleeves do move around a little bit that's why uh, heat cycling is important on break-in and then I, I still on the outside uh, you can actually kind of see in this area is where I where the tooling is for the resizing and uh, I stone the outside some people polish sleeves I I don't really it doesn't do anything for you might look a little nicer for you but it doesn't do anything I I'd stone it to uh, get the high spots and get it kind of more uniform and get the high spots you can see right there is a little bit of you know there's some uh, not perfect things aren't perfect from the factory so and then uh, when you send a piston and sleeve to resize I also clean the piston top I I put a little WD-40 on some really fine grits uh, sand wet and wet or dry paper and have it on a, a surface plate have the um, sandpaper on there and then run it back and forth and, and you have to be careful not to round the edges I've, I've seen some guys use like a like a polishing you know like in a drill or something and do this and then they round the corners you don't want to round the corners um, only in extreme cases will I uh, touch up the outside of the piston I, this this darkness and all this it doesn't doesn't matter as long as things are clean now one thing to look out for you you disassemble an engine you get it cleaned up and there's little scratches sometimes all over the piston and you you either got dirt through it or kind of even some small sand or the rear bearings coming apart and sometimes that rear bearing will feel fine and it but it's not there's little pieces of the chrome balls flaking off or the bearings coming apart and and there's it's pretty common that you can't really feel the bearing being bad but you'll see little scratches in the piston and a lot of times it comes from the from the bearing and it's kind of an early sign so you can actually see that if, if you uh, even bef before taking your engine apart it's not if it's running erratic uh, nine times out of ten if your engine just all of a sudden won't tune and, and you you thought you had a pretty good handle you've got many gallons on this engine you know it left back and forth and, and uh, all of a sudden it just won't tune for you nine times out of ten either you know your compression is low you get a bearing going out um, the crank and rod are worn too much something something is mechanically wrong with it you know it could be even a plug fuel line or a fuel tank that's bad or something too but if you kind of think you might have a bearing going out, it's getting a little erratic. You can kind of look in there with a flashlight when the pistons, when the engine's all together, and see those scratches. And it doesn't necessarily um, wreck the piston and sleeve. I see it all the time. I, I kind of touch it up a little bit and resizing, and you you wouldn't even know that there's scratches in the piston. So it doesn't junk out the engine. And then uh, I don't like to check the rear bearings. The rear bearings when you have fuel residue in there with the, some uh, with the uh, castor oil and the oils from the fuel with thicker oil in there the bearing will feel pretty good I liked after I clean everything up so I have a, a hot water washer it's a parts washer that that more does uh, like engine blocks and you know that kind of thing it does a nice job cleaning up blocks uh, without oil residue cleans everything nice uh, for for at home, I, I don't really. It's been so while. It's been so long since I've done something like that. I don't really have a good way. I, I guys use brake cleaner and some different things. And basically, the biggest thing about the whole assembly process and is cleanliness. If you have some dirt in there, it can scratch your piston. Um, you know, a little piece. If you a piece of something, or you know, the cleanliness is the most important part of this assembly process. So once I have everything cleaned up, that's when you can check the the rear bearing, and then uh, I'll usually pull when I clean everything apart. I'll pull the front bearing out. If I take an engine apart to rebuild it, I'll always uh, replace the front bearing. I, they're only like six dollars, so it's it's a something that should be changed because there dirt dirt will get in the there's this one's a double sealed dirt will in get in there uh, between the the seals and uh, kind of wear out the balls and it'll wear in there and it's and the dirt from there can actually get through into the engine and give you a little bit of wear too so it's best to replace that I use a uh, I use this this huddy uh, bearing tool uh, 
There's a different collet sizes for a different one, but this means mainly for the 14 millimeter cranks, and it does the, but it does both bearings. I'm not going to do a video on this. If you have one of these, it has pretty detailed instructions on how to do it. So I think I've shown it in one video kind of a little bit, but you need to do bearings right. You almost need to uh, have a have a nice bearing tool. There's ways to do it with heating them up and pounding them on a piece of wood and stuff, but I recommend uh, a bearing uh, remover tool. And Red's, Red's has one that looks similar to that Huddy one too. I haven't used the Red's one. So uh, I installed I st installed a new front bearing here. And then to check the rear bearing, I, I usually just put a little bit of WD-40, just a little squirt of WD-40 in there or some kind of really light oil and feel it. And it feels smooth. And then I'll put the crank in it. Put the crank in it, feel feel smooth, and then I want to take and kind of I'm almost kind of rocking. I'm I'm forcing the crank back and forth at the top here, and you can see a little bit of movement sometimes between the case and the crank. And when it when it's loose, the bearing might be feel good and stuff, but it's got a little bit of wear to it. And this one this one's really good. I can't feel any rocking, and I can't see it down in there, but. That's what I look for in a bearing. Sometimes, if, like if you don't have the bearing tools and you don't have a lot of the tools to do a proper rebuild, it's it's easiest just to send it to me. I charge thirty dollars for all the labor. All you have to do is pay for the bearing, or if you need a rod or something. So it, it's pretty reasonable. I think I've had the same price for five, seven years for uh, rebuilds. So I have a down, you know pretty good so I, I don't really I've done so many that I can do it pretty quickly that I, I haven't raised the price and another thing I do is uh, polish the head button get that carbon off there if you saw this one this one was pretty black when I took it apart and uh, I'll polish the head button clean that up too so I'm trying to think I think we covered everything here uh, we can start the assembly process so I, I like to, uh, I use a kind of a blend of different oils, a little bit of like Mobile One synthetic oil, some uh, castor oil, and uh, after a lot of guys use after run oil and stuff when they assemble an engine. It's kind of preference. It's just oil. You want something slippery to get it, get it lubricated um, before the fuel gets run through there. You know, keep your lubrication. And I'll put a few drops. On the rear bearing balls, just kind of around there, just to, just to lubricate that a little bit. And then, uh, if if I'm going to run the engine right away, I don't really oil the crank. But if this thing, this one's probably going to sit till spring, so I'll give it some oil around the outside. So when I slide it in there, it kind of you know keeps it from rusting. And I'll put this is most important is to put oil all the way around the crank pin, and then uh, slide it in there. And then I'll uh, put some on the rod bushing in there. And then you slide it. You put it in there. Just put it over the crank pin. And let it drop down on there. Get a little bit of it. It has to be at the top. And there, that's together. And then uh, I usually will a few streaks of oil on the sleeve and one thing too about when I stone the outside it stone the high spots off the sleeve like that it makes it install a lot nicer and there there is times where a burr or something will happen you know some dried fuel or something where it, if the sleeve comes out really hard and I try and put it back together and it, it's just going tight I'll take it back apart and I'll take some uh, like 600 emery paper and, and kind of sand the inside so that goes in a little bit easier. Then you'll have to re-clean everything after you do that, but you don't want that grit around. And then uh, we slide slide the sleeve in. And then uh, you have to kind of just do a little rocking around here to get the 
piston up in the sleeve like that and then you have to uh, line up the alignment pins the alignment pin for the sleeve that keeps it from turning and lines it up where the exhaust port is pointing in the right direction that's about it on the block you can see this block I was gonna say this block looks like it has some dirt on it yet but this is actually cleaned up pretty good in the parts washer it's uh, our local tracks use uh, chloride sometimes in it it kind of chloride if you don't wash it off right away it'll kind of you know be acidic to the blocks and kind of mess things up a little bit so so next we're uh, looking at the head shims you want to make sure you store them and don't have the the head shims uh, bent you don't want to bend them or anything and then kind of clean them up both sides I get a lot of engines in to rebuild and stuff and they you can see dirt embedded in this in the shims and stuff so you don't want to uh, want to make sure they're clean and everything install them on the head button and then uh, we'll put the head button on and, and a lot of times a lot of times there's a dimple or you know different kind of markings on there this one I've had a part before and I put just a real light X in there so I know where my exhaust side is it's not the end of the world if it's not the same and then we want to put it on you know make sure you're not dropping your or moving your shims so that's why I usually do it sideways put it on there kind of line up the holes a little bit there we go with that and then we're gonna make sure everything's clean on the head you don't you don't want any dirt on the mating surfaces there and I'll take and uh, because there's a steel screw aluminum block and a lot of times when you take them apart they'll really snap and stuff and and to prevent that and what that when you get a real heavy snap when you taking a screw apart a lot of times that's um, the bottom side of the screw here, uh, fr the friction between that and the, and the anodizing and the aluminum head. So when I assemble an engine, I'll put a drop of oil on the threads, and then I drop oil on the bottom side of the head of the screw. You can see I, I cleaned these screws up a little bit, but I'm not, they're not, I didn't run them through the parts washer. I could lose them and stuff. So the, the screws, I, I wipe them down a little bit, but I don't, it's not going in the engine at all, so I, I don't really worry about the screws too much. Put the head on, then we'll drop the screws down in the holes. Hopefully I'm not shaking too much. It's getting a little chilly. I tried, had to turn the furnace off in the shop here so it wasn't loud and getting a little chilly. Okay, and then we kind of have to make sure everything's straight and the holes are lined up. And then uh, put it down there. And then uh, we're going to just, I just went down until it hit. I'll do that with all four screws here. Okay, and then when you tighten them, you're going to do, you can tighten this one, and we're going to tighten the one across from it. And then we're going to tighten one of the other two, and we're going to tighten across from it. You don't have to go like super tight the first time. Uh, like I said in the, the video for taking apart engines, good tools, good quality tools that won't strip the screws are important. So, um, you want to tighten it more than I, I might as well just do it now. Uh, but, uh, I go through and tighten them and then go through and tighten them again and you always want to do a crisscross pattern. These tighter drivers don't drop in the holes as quite as good every time. 
Okay, we got that tight. They don't have to be super, super tight, but pretty, pretty tight. It's, it's hard to explain, but so then a lot of times I'll kind of check my compression uh, before I put the back plate on just to make sure everything's good. And you feel a good, there's a good pop, and that's, that's what you're looking for. Even if there's not, if you take the glow plug out and you don't feel a lot of resistance at the top, that's really doesn't mean a whole lot you want to when you roll an engine over whether the clutch is on it or whatever you want to feel a good pop at the top and it kicks it back and there's also a difference between an engine hot and an engine cold like this so now we'll put the back plate on just like when we disassembled it you don't want to have the piston at the bottom if you had the piston at the bottom you're going to shove this in there and it's going to break the bottom of the skirt then your piston and sleeve are junk so you want to make sure the piston's up and then uh, just slide it together and then you want to feel some resistance with that o-ring this one's not too bad the, probably the worst engines uh, for uh, the backplate seal is the OS they a lot of times they drop right in and in that case you want to either replace the o-ring or maybe put a little bit of sealant uh, on the very lightly some silicone sealant on this just super lightly you don't want a bead there you want just like put some on your finger and just wipe it just so you can see you're gonna see through it I've seen some some engines uh, where they put silicone on there and it's all the way up you know it's a quarter inch away from the mating surface all you need is just a, f a thin film of it so we're gonna put this in here and then uh, you just install your screws in the back plate and then uh, you can tell this whole time that yeah, this, this uh, gasket needs to be, exhaust gasket needs to be replaced probably. It's not terrible, but it's, it's getting, getting bad there. So Another thing on the carburetor, uh, most times I'll just uh, I'll hose it down with some WD-40, blow it off with an air hose, blow it off the inside with an air hose. You can see this one's pretty dirty. Yet. I actually cleaned this, you know, I, I cleaned this thing pretty good, and it, that stuff just won't come off. That could be... I think this one got a little bit uh, etched uh, by the chloride also and then the dirt kind of stuck to it or something. Part of this is from my rubber bands too, kind of getting a little gummy with the fuel and stuff. But uh, as long as the inside's clean, the, the block and the carb and you know, that stuff, that doesn't really matter what this outside looks like, as long as the insides are clean. You want to make sure your car is a nice smooth to it and then another way to check see I have a cap on here you want to check your car boot and make sure it doesn't have a hole in it just even the slightest little pinhole in it can cause it to run uh, leak a little air in and then sometimes like if you pull a slide open plug both ends it shouldn't go down all the way see well it's in this one's not very good some some engines are easier to check than others but and so and then you can kind of feel a the vapor lock there. So maybe try it this way. Yeah, see that's pretty good. It's not leaking because I take my fingers off and it goes out. So. And I've had some carbs a leak, especially the Alpha engines or this uh, banjo fitting here wasn't really flat, and so the gaskets on either side didn't really seal very well. And it would just cause the slightest little air bubbles in the carb, and it'd run okay, but it always ran better if you. I gotta take this banjo fitting off. It was brass on the alphas and then stoned it. Most other engines are pretty good there too with that. So I think that's about it. Oh, there's one thing here too. I I'd mentioned when I took on the disassembly video. Uh the the Philo. And this is the This is the 5.0 by 0 0.8, and that's the one I was telling you is the best one for uh for uh, Novorossi engines, if you're working on Novorossi engines, the tips hold up. They're hard, but yet they're not brittle hard and stuff, and they they last for years. They're just really good. Plus, they uh, they will fit in the back plate. They're small. It's small enough it'll fit in the back plate screws also for the Novorossis. That's about it for the video today. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something. Um, keep in touch. I'll try and do more videos where 
probably looking at some new uh, review engines for 2021 so thanks for watching